Hello, welcome to the Hawthorne College Craft Podcast. I'm Kate. You can find me on Instagram as Kate underscore Hawthorne College Craft, on Ravelry as a Runner Bean, and we have a Ravelry group for the podcast called Hawthorne College Craft Podcast. This is a Coffee with Kate, and today it's a very special Coffee with Kate. I am here at Emma's house, who is Willie Mammoth Fiber Co, and she and I are going to have a chat about some knitting. Well, bit of a change of personnel. We've mm-hmm. gone from Rufus to Emma. Emma, thank you very much for taking the time out to chat to us and let me grill you. Oh, thanks for coming <laughs> to visit me. Well, you know me, I'm always up for a visit. We cut the tea and all. Uh-huh, exactly. So, tell us a wee bit about yourself. Who are you Who and are? how will people know you and where to find you? Well, my name's Emma. And I am, I am the Woolly Mama Fibre Company. <laughs> Me, myself, oh, and, and I. I. <laughs> um, and I naturally dye yarns and sell them online, which is what I tell like average punters. Like, you know, like if I meet someone like my mum's friend or like someone at Badminton, they're like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I sell a yarn. And then if they ask another question, then I'm like, I sell yarn online, and then if they ask another question, then I'm like, oh yeah, well I actually dye the yarn as well, because <laughs> they they don't really yeah, get it. Yeah. And I don't don't usually say yarn. I say wool because they don't understand. No. What's yarn? <laughs> no, no, because this part of the country, which we will get to, is kind of very much mm. wool covers everything, mm-hmm. uh, acrylic, everything. Um, yeah. It's not. Um. So yeah. So that's me, really. Where are you based? Where are we? We are in the north coast of Northern Ireland. Um, you're about an hour from me. Yeah, not far. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're you're close to the Giants Causeway. Yeah, and all those things. Rush and all those Tourist beautiful places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the most beautiful part of this country, I do believe. Yeah, yeah. it is pretty stunning, to be honest. Yeah. Mm, you should come and visit (laughs) yes yes i i lived here for a few years as a student so i can yeah vouch for how beautiful it is and it's well it's nearly on my doorstep and Mm -hmm. it is on your doorstep Mm -hmm. and do you live here alone i know i'm married yep uh and i have a little girl and um a dog who's a wee bit naughty quite often (laughs) he's lovely and i think everybody who watches your podcast Oh, they all love him. They all love him. And they don't know what he's really like, but... <laughs> <laughs> he's lovely. I can attest to that, too. He's lovely when he's in the house. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could say that about most animals and children, really. Yeah. He loves <laughs> just lying here. Like, he'll lie on the sofa all day uh-huh. and be happy. It's like kids. Kids are lovely when they're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Okay, uh, so... <laughs> You dye yarn and you obviously knit. So tell us a little bit about your knitting history. When did you learn to knit? Have you always been a knitter? Um, no. So um, my granny tried to teach me how to knit when I was wee. That did not go very well. <laughs> um, I think I hear a lot of people say that the same thing happens to them. Someone tries to teach them to knit yeah. when they're like a child. I hated knitting when I was I just also. like didn't get it. Um, but then I went to art college and I met a girl there who was really into crafting and stuff. So first of all, it was crochet and then she taught me how to knit. And uh, that seems to be quite a natural step for people to go from crochet to knitting. Yeah. Um, I certainly was like you yeah. growing up. Um, didn't like knitting, was intimidated by knitting. And I think that was because my mum was such a good knitter, possibly like your granny. Yeah. Um, and I found it very difficult and then I started, I learned how to crochet as an adult mm-hmm. and moved from crochet into knitting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so you. the friend, um, shout out to Kim if you're watching, um, she taught me how to knit and spin and dye. Okay. So that's how that all started and then when I was at university that's when I started getting into really knitting but mm-hmm. I was not very good and when I say that I mean I was like not, I didn't understand the technicalities of it at all and obviously like if you have a bit of that knowledge it really helps to expand your creativeness when you're knitting I think yeah so yeah so that's when I learned how to knit but I didn't really super get into it 
and like start to understand it until I came home from uni. I think I was what age would I have been? 22, 23 maybe. And that's when it started getting really into it. Mm -hmm. And like discovering like knitting patterns and you can buy them online. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you kind of come to this realization that it's not just your granny. Yeah. That it has become quite a thing. And yeah. there's such a community out there through podcasts and yeah, festivals I didn't, and right, things. I, like, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but then that was still at the time of, I didn't have the internet on my phone. Mm -hmm. So it was more just, you only could figure out, well, obviously you could Google stuff. That was usually not my first instinct. Mm -hmm. I would ask someone, I'd still nearly ask someone mm -hmm. first, like to gain knowledge about something. Yeah. That's the way I learn, I think. But yeah, what was the question? Oh yeah, my knitting journey. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, so then I came back from uni and started dying. So I suppose yeah. when I started dying, mm -hmm. I got, way more into yeah. knitting. Yeah, that was kind of my next question, kind of why or how did you start dyeing, kind of making that progression from knitting to going, well, I actually want to dye the yarn. Yeah, well, I think it was more like I was doing a lot of photography around that time and I just wanted to do something more like tactile. And so I had learned how to do the natural dyeing a little bit at uni, so I just started dabbling with it mm -hmm. and um, just, you know, like in the kitchen or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, then I just had too much that I could knit with, but I was enjoying the creative process of dyeing and I wanted to do more experiments mm -hmm. with that. So I was like, oh, well, T Timmy actually said, he was like, you should just try and sell it so you can buy more and do more experiments or whatever. I was Good like, for yeah. Timmy. We are happy that Timmy got that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that and then it like sold out and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> People yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose the natural dyes over? That's acid just what dyes? I knew. Uh -huh. I don't okay. like. I still. I have a vague idea of how you would do acid dyeing, mm -hmm. but that's just like what I started with. So that's like what I know. Okay. So I suppose it was just like, well, I'll just go back to what I know and like start building my knowledge mm -hmm. on that. I could have went the other way and done some acid dyeing. I think I did a little workshop in acid dyeing. Did I? Maybe I didn't. But um. I suppose the market for naturally dyed yarns still isn't as big uh, when, no. when it, it, there's demand for it, but what I mean is it's quite niche. The, yeah, there are uh, still more people dying with acid yes. dyes um, than natural dyes. Yeah, but I think the natural dyes definitely appeal to me more as like a... The aesthetic? Not the Maybe. aesthetic, more just like the process of natural mm -hmm. dyeing. I was quite interested in that. Mm -hmm. Whereas like a new acid dyeing was more just like not mathematical, but more like you just do it. Mm -hmm. And of course you can experiment with colors and stuff, but like there's something about natural dye and something about it coming from plants, something coming about it coming from stuff that I could pick myself from different locations yeah. that was kind of important to me. So I think that is what drew me to the natural okay. dye probably mm -hmm. because I did a project when I was at uni, it was like photography and natural dye and mixed. So basically I went around London and collected um, like plant material from different places in London and took a photograph of that place. And then I wove this little like mat thing that was connected to all these photographs. Um, so yeah, there's something about that. Has always appealed. Yeah, kind of something mm -hmm. about where something comes from. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, I can't exactly describe yeah. it, but. Well, you saying that kind of leads into the next question, which um, you're saying where things come from. We live in Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland is full of sheep, mm -hmm. absolutely full of sheep. But the majority of the sheep that are bred here, I, I would assume most of their wool is going into the carpet making industry. And I would say a lot of it's lost. Um, but you seem to source local yarn. How do you go about sourcing those local mm -hmm. yarns and um, why was that important to you? So the very first limited edition yarn I think I got was, you kind of need to get in there with the first one mm -hmm. <laughs> and then someone knows someone that knows someone. But the first one I was driving past near where I was born and I was like looking out the window, there's someone in the car with me and I was like, is that Jack, are those Jacob's sheep? 
and she was like, she's from a farming background and she was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know who they belong to. I was like, oh right, okay, who do they belong to? She's like, they belong to so-and-so. I was like, right, and how would I get in touch with him? She says, well, you might know his sister and there's a fair chance she'll be sitting in that cafe over there. Yeah, it's Northern Ireland. Everybody knows everybody or yes. one person attached to that person. Yeah. Because it's quite a small community. So anyway, I went into this cafe, which by the way, I don't know if you know, it's called the Creamery Can. It's like, you know, the, the first Creamery place, Can. I think that's the first place we met up for coffee. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was. Mm -hmm. And um, so went in there, lo and behold, this woman's sitting and I was like, oh, can I have your brother's phone number, please? <laughs> and she was like, why? <laughs> so then you have to get into the whole story of, mm -hmm. oh, a sheep are over there and, mm -hmm. you know, want to buy the fleeces. Why? Why do you want to buy that? <laughs> and on we go. So eventually I got in touch with him and I answered the phone. He's like, hello? Hello? I was like, hello, um, I would like to buy your fleeces. Ha, uh, what? <laughs> um, so eventually I got out of him that yes, I could have them and uh, how much it would cost and all. And I said I would go and pick them up and everything. So that's how the first one happened. Mm -hmm. Then, Jacobs, I think I had that. I think I probably either knit with it or it's a moustache. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, I met a girl called um, Brona who had some uh, different sheep and I got um, I got some wool off her. I met her through a mutual friend mm -hmm. and she put me in touch with one of her friends who's a shearer. So I got in touch with him and he um, very kindly alerts me if there's anything that I would be interested mm -hmm. in. And then I can find fleeces that way. Mm -hmm. It's good to make the connections. Yes. Once the connections start. Yes. And then also just, uh, I've just got to know people because like one person says, oh, well, you know, my brother or my, my mm -hmm. niece or whoever has this block, are you interested in that? And then it just goes on and you kind of, you get to know people or somebody's yeah. neighbor or somebody's interested in this specific breed, this mm -hmm. woman's the head of the breed society of this breed and she keeps these because she really likes them. Oh, and she's got 300. <laughs> yeah, and what's nice is then that you know exactly where they should have been yeah. and where they're from. And I suppose for the environment too, it's close. And yeah. Not, um, yeah. Having to outsource, yeah. really. Yeah. And we do have a lot of sheep, so. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> This has been passed. Yeah. <laughs> so of all those sheep and fleeces that you've worked with, what has been your favourite locally based yarn or favourite based generally? That's a really tricky question to be honest. Um, different ones are good for different things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I could say I have a definite favourite. I would have a definite favourite for like Socks or yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But I mean, like the Causeway yarns, I've had it for a few years now, and the man that keeps the sheep, he's great, and he they're really his pets because he has like a day job. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, let's see if I have an example to show you. This is all Causeway yarn. There's a beautiful, beautiful stack of yarn sitting over here. It's mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, this is the Causeway yarn. It's a mix of Teeswater and Oxford Down and it's wool and spun. So all my limited editions are wool and spun. So good Which for... Which means? It means that it's not worse it's spun. <laughs> so like it's airier, um, it's good for colour work, good for steaking. It means I think when it's being produced the fibres go in more like this to the machine rather than it like makes it this. more grippy, doesn't it? Yes, it's more smooth. grippy. So like when something's worst it's spun, the result in yarn is more slick, yeah. I would say. Yeah, smoother. There's that there smoother. It, it hasn't the Whereas this is the down more or the haze almost but woolly. Sticks. I would yeah. say it's, it feels yeah. more woolly. And yeah. So I've cut into this, but you can see obviously like it's not going anywhere. I mean, I actually think these are fine for steaking as well. Yeah. And is this the yarn you used for your recent um, sweater for, for your daughter? Yes. 
Um, Ready to show that sweater? Yes. Um, this is a swatch for the Ola yoke, by the way, you've uh -huh. maybe seen it. Uh -huh. I will link uh, Emma's latest episode up above. I think you talk about yeah. this. No. Um, so I actually mixed two yarns. Mm -hmm. I used the Causeway and my natural sock. Okay. Which I hadn't done before, but it turned out really, really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't see much difference between this and this, to be honest with you. It's not really There's that difference, yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. it works really well, mixing the two bases. That's the first time I did that. This is a pattern by Albina McLaughlin. Who is like a pattern wizard, in my she opinion. Is. She is, she's very good. And um, this is really... This was, I found it really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. First all over colour work. Steaking, stick here, stick mm -hmm. here, stick, stick here. Then um, adding on this collar. Mm -hmm. Never done picked up stitches in the vertical yeah. way before. And then the arms are grafted on, mm -hmm. which okay. was interesting. And that's that's what's so beautiful about this yarn is that for sticking and things, it doesn't slip. It, yeah, it, it holds. It's really good. For example, should I turn it inside out? I'll just show you what it looks like, sure. It's not particularly neat, but... I have never braved the sticking. I've tried it on an old rough sweater, yeah. but I haven't tried it in anything that I've knit. <laughs> well, obviously you could cover like that mm -hmm. with, you know, the wee ribbons that people do that with, but I haven't bothered yet. Your floats are very neat. Oh, thank you. They are. There wasn't too many rows where I had to do the catch the floats, mm -hmm. so it's fine. That's what it looks like on the inside. Not super neat, but it looks neat to me. <laughs> and the thing about that is it all kind of felt in on each other anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, really good yarn for staking and colour work basically. Okay. I love any limited edition yarn mm -hmm. for staking or colour work. And a lot of your limited edition yarns you keep to their natural colour, don't you? Yeah. Uh, well, like this one. Uh -huh. I think um, the this one. that I had. Yeah, was it was natural. probably on diet yeah. as well. Yeah. And I, so, I, like, I keep having so this much. idea of doing like this with like these colours. Mm. I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like doing a dark colour with really bright colours and could be really cool, I think. Yeah. Um, sorry, what? Okay. No, 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 that, that, that's okay. Oh, oh yeah, the undyed yeah, colours. Yeah, yeah. Might as well show this yeah. braid. So yeah, I like trying out different braids. Ones that you'd think, or like you wouldn't think would really work for knitting yarn. Mm -hmm. So this one was my latest one. It is Blue Textile and Swore Balls. Mm -hmm. Beautiful knitting yarn. Mm -hmm. Textiles, lovely for knitting with. And like, I actually know somebody who breeds textiles near Bala Money. So the <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> so I could maybe give you a contact. Yes. There. <laughs> Beautiful. And like, you would never think, like, because they're just everywhere here. Mm -hmm. You would never think, oh yeah, that'd be good for yeah. knitting with. Mm -hmm. But I just try stuff. Um, and the guy at the mill, I talk to him, and he can give me a good indication mm -hmm. of what would be like a good blend yeah. or what would work well together. That is our only problem, isn't it? We don't have a mill here. Yeah. We have to yeah. send yarn out to, to be milled. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, you're talking about the undyed and the dyed. What inspires your dye colour choices? You know, what is it nature or what inspires your colour? Um, I'm just going to take this off because I'm really yeah. warm. She did, she did. Uh, I was going to say threaten or promise, whichever way you look at it, a strip tea. <laughs> true, true story. Um, see, this is, even the undyed colours are different. They are. This is uh, Hebridean and Black Welsh Mountain, so you can see the difference. Like, yeah, isn't they, they don't all just turn out the same, same yeah. which I like. Um, what inspires my colours? Well, it depends. Sometimes it's the colours themselves mm -hmm. and like I'll want to try like a variation on this colour or try like a cross between this colour and this colour or sometimes I just want to use up an exhaust bath so then mm -hmm. I do that. Sometimes I have quite a clear vision in my head of like a palette of colours or like it can literally be anything from just an yeah, idea. Yeah wasn't it Polly Pocket dolls? Yeah. Yeah. That was just so yeah. random I was just like oh those colours like it can really mm -hmm. be anything. I've seen a photo of some nice poppies recently and like then that became a little mm -hmm. like a mini palette in itself mm -hmm. but um 
yeah, it can literally be anything. anything. So sometimes it's directed by an idea from, mm -hmm. so it's like coming from the outside mm -hmm. or it can come from the inside, from the dyes and wanting to experiment with those. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes they collide and <laughs> good create magic. Happen. They create magic. So how do you pick the names? Because I, I think naming things is so difficult. It's I tried so to name hard. podcast episodes. It's impossible. It's really hard. So how do you pick the names when you're so regularly coming up with new colours? How do you pick the names? This is really hard, honestly. Sometimes I asked people, mm -hmm. what would you name this? And sometimes, yeah. honestly, sometimes I can sit and look at something for like quite a long time or like I can ruminate on a colour for a long time. Sometimes it comes to me when I'm dying it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... Sometimes it speaks to you just as it is. You yeah. Just think, oh, you're definitely a... Uh, yes. Or sometimes it's like... I have to put two words together to make more like a, f a feeling mm -hmm. of a thing like this one. I was like looking at this going, this is like lime. It looks more mustard on here, but it's more lime. And I was like, but I don't want to name it lime. That's like a really boring name mm -hmm. for a colour. And then my aunt was here and I was like, like, what could I name this? I want it to be like summery mm -hmm. and fresh. And she was like, what about mojito? And I was like, yeah, Perfect. but I feel like it needs something else. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, what about fizz, mojito fizz? She was like, yeah, I think that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like names come better usually when you bounce them off someone yes. else, I think. Okay. So that's how that happens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm flicking through a book or listening to an album mm -hmm. and I get ideas yeah. that way. Yeah. Oops. Oh, oh. There's yarn raining down everywhere. <laughs> okay, so describe a typical day for the Willie Mammoth Fibre Company. A typical day or days does it take days from the start of a process to the end rather than you don't do it all in a day i would assume no no um so yes so <laughs> where do i start because you're you're a working mommy and yeah being a mommy in itself is a full-time job so yes trying to run a so business start from, the start, from your then. home mm -hmm. yeah i'll start right from the start my day starts <laughs> with um a toddler crying down the monitor going mommy 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 <laughs> mommy and then i get up and you don't grow out of it mommy mommy <laughs> it's kind of cute but also not what you want to hear in yeah. the morning but anyway um so get her up if it's my day to do that get her dressed and possibly take her to wherever she's going or maybe my husband does that depends on the day then I like to have her wherever she's going to by like happy at the latest so then I get a good run at my work. So my work, I kind of think of it more in terms of like month, a month. Mm -hmm. So the first three weeks I'll be dying and then the last week's like shop update and packing and inventory and photography and all of that stuff. So yeah, so usually like four days a week I do dying or thereabouts or doing uh -huh. yarn related things, twisting, labelling, all that sort of thing. And then it's a very physical job. Yeah, a lot of lifting mm -hmm. pots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of forgetting that because it's so like, that's just what I do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so like every first and third day I'll be mordant and, and every second and fourth day I'll be dying. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Have I got that right? It depends on how it goes basically. Yeah. But you put the yarn in to the pots, mordant, and then that's there until the next day and then you can put on another batch and then that's there to the next yeah. day and so it's just you're having to keep the cycle going so yeah one thing's ready for the next exactly mm -hmm. and then if you fall behind basically it's like it gets like a logistical nightmare yeah you're almost starting all over again kind of yeah. yeah um and yeah when it comes to the fourth week the shop update week then for that, then I have to photograph all the yarn that I've done in the last three weeks and list it on the website, do social media stuff, send out a newsletter, blog post, show really long stories and then the shop update happens and then I have to get it all packed. Um, at the moment, my auntie's helping me pack the shop mm -hmm. update. She's been helping me for a little while. She's really good at it. And yeah, I think 
that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lifting pots, a lot of rinsing schemes, drying mm -hmm. schemes, twisting schemes, trying to come up with colour names. <laughs> That sort yeah. of thing. So it's, it's trying to keep the creativity going with the more mundane and repetitive yeah. things. Sometimes though I find like if I'm becoming not creative I just have to stop for a while Yeah. and do something else. Yeah, I think that, that is part of creativity where you have to take the time out to, to recharge. Yeah, like you have to stop and then like ideas start coming again yeah. so it's... It seems kind of productive, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's not. And then you come up with clubs as well, so you're kind of having to come again. up with everything around that. Yeah, I don't do a lot of clubs really. Mm -hmm. I haven't in the last while, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'm kind of into this thing at the minute of these like mini palettes of colour that allow me to be flexible creatively and also come up with something that I really, really like, yeah. but without having to make like loads of it. Yeah. So I'm really, I'm into that at the minute. That at the minute. Yeah. And that's the thing, it's about shaking it up, isn't it? For yourself. Yeah. I mean, obviously everybody likes the, the, the same things coming through all the time because that's what we know and love. Yeah. But it's nice to see for you as well that you can drop in things that you don't normally put in. And yeah, that's where keeps I you fresh. Yeah, it keeps you fresh. Yeah. Um, and keeps that going. You also kind of have in the last few months uh, gone a slightly different direction and anybody who's watched my podcast has seen that I was doing a little bit of a test knit mm -hmm. for you because you uh, released a, a shawl pattern it was the beautiful Fernie corner shawl which is basically set on the Irish name for Coleraine which mm -hmm. is your nearest big town to yeah. here um, Coolrathian cool means, means the Fernie corner yes <laughs> I, I was as I said, I was at university here and it was in Korean and that was the first I knew that mm -hmm. when I was, was knitting the, the pattern. And it's a beautiful, beautiful pattern and you should be very, very proud of it. Um, did you enjoy the process? And mm. will there be more? <laughs> Probably not going to be more. <laughs> <laughs> did I enjoy the process? Did it scratch an itch? I think it did. Yeah. I mean... It took me, I think, like three years or something to finally do it mm -hmm. from start to finish. I think when I first started it, I had quite a lot of energy with it. And then it just kind of, when I got to the bit of actually writing a pattern, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I don't really like this. Because yeah. I think I remember at the start of the process, you talking about wanting to create a shawl and you were showing me wee bits yeah. and pieces. Like I yeah. have, like I can come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. Like I can design stuff if designing stuff is drawing ideas and coming up with ideas and what would look good with what but the whole bit of actually writing the pattern not my cup of tea mm -hmm. yeah so if someone wants to write i'll come up with the <laughs> ideas and you can write the pattern and then we'll go 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the good thing about a shawl is that it's one size yeah i, I think, think i think it must be very difficult for the garment creators yeah. because you really want to be very size inclusive yeah. and that you know that I just have no that's a mathematical of how to grade yeah, anything. I wouldn't have a clue either. But there's people that do that, mm -hmm. and you pay them, and they would do that. Yeah. I don't know how much it is, but like if I was doing that, I would definitely yeah. not like I'd be happy for someone else. To do. Yeah, I I admire the the mathematical part of it, and I admire the creativity and coming up with patterns because I don't think I have that creative bone. I don't have the mathematical bone, that's uh -huh. why I find it so difficult to be honest, like it was a struggle, a really a big mm -hmm. struggle and I had quite a lot of people helping me and advising me. Well, it, it came out very, very well, it's a beautiful, beautiful show. Thanks, it's... I was pleased with it in the end but I didn't find it easy. <laughs> <laughs> so that, there won't be another one soon. Unless I have some other itch that I need to scratch but I can't see yeah. it at the minute, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what can we look forward to in the future of Willie Mammoth Fibre Company? Like the near future? Near, distant, whatever. Okay. Well, I've got a shop update tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this might not be up in time for the shop update. There was no, a shop I don't update. Think it would. Uh -huh. um, I think you'll see a lot more bright zingy colours. Like I've been enjoying this little palette and I was thinking I would like to create some sort of like mini scheme i'll not say collection but a mini scheme set with these bright zingy colors because i just feel like i'm having a moment in my own wardrobe where 
I'm experimenting a wee bit and I'm thinking, can I wear this colour? Could I wear this colour? What would happen if I wore this colour? Mm. Um, so I think I'll be doing a bit more of this over the summer, I think, mm. and feeling that mm. vibe for the summer. Might have some sort of little mini collection mm. in July, August. Um, with maybe like these sort of colours mm -hmm. and you'll obviously be getting loads of limited edition bases. I think I'm going to try and launch another one in July, possibly, don't know, don't hold me to it. Mm -hmm. um, just loads of local yarns and natural dyes and just basically what I always do. Mm -hmm. And have you any plans for premises? Oh well now that one's is that top secret? <laughs> That's top secret. That's top secret. It's out of the bag, you people. <laughs> um, yeah, I might be getting a studio, like outside of my house. Well, is it outside of my house? Well, it's yeah, but... your back garden. I might be getting something in my back garden. That's all we'll say. We'll yeah. leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, watch the space. Watch the space. <laughs> and yes, yeah. that'll be a big big effort yeah so, so there's a lot going on for for really mama fiber company there's a lot going on and there's only so much time to do it so yeah, you just yeah. have to do what you can yeah yeah and occasionally let people like me into the house to under the pretense of coming for a cup of coffee and going can i interview you when i'm here <laughs> <laughs> this is us working <laughs> it is this is work this we're is working work. really hard <laughs> <laughs> i was just looking for a, an afternoon out <laughs> oh, i love getting a wee visitor yeah, I, I like common, I have to say. The tea's always good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, tea's always good. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us here. Well, thanks for, for having me. Um, just been, been part of this. And yeah, that is kind of the chat for today. And hopefully I'll be back again with another coffee with uh, Kate because I've quite enjoyed being back doing yeah. this kind of more informal um set up and until the next time enjoy your knitting.